On a gravestone, it's understood that that little dash between the birth date and the death date represents the person's life. Everything he or she ever did summed up in that short little line. If you are watching this, you obviously don't have the second date chiseled into the stone yet. Your life still has road to travel, so that leads us to ask an important question. How should you plan the rest of your life? Hello, I'm Lynetta. I'm Patrick. And together we are co-founders of Vertical, Vertical Connections, Connections Inc. Inc. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us again. If you are new to this channel, be sure to subscribe. Everyone click the like channel. Let's increase those likes. Yes. Please share this message. We greatly appreciate all the comments that, have, that you leave and we look forward to reading those in the future. Knowing the parable of the rich fool may help you with the question of how should you plan the rest of your life. If you would please take up your Bibles and follow along as we read Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to, the, to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In this parable, we should identify that there are two focuses that must be avoided. Excuse me, two forces that must be avoided. Hypocrisy and greed. Hypocrisy relates to the spiritual realm, and greed relates to the material world. Both the material and immaterial worlds threaten to damn eternal souls. Beware of false religion, and beware of material wealth, which includes the love of money. The real issue is either lay up treasures for yourself, or establish your treasures in God. Wealth creates wealth creates all kinds of choices, and that's what the parable indicates. As we look at verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. God was addressed as if he were a stranger. It's like a man speaking what the man speaking was implying, I don't know you or anything about you, and I have no relation with you. In the next verse it reads, But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? We read this in John 5 that God has appointed all judgment to Christ, and this is a spiritual judgment. Jesus continues in verse 15, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He says the whole crowd, Be on your guard against every form of greed. He's not just talking about to the man that spoke out. He's talking to everyone. In Ecclesiastes, it is wisdom that Solomon says in chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. People who worship money and who love money and who love abundance and love possessions are never satisfied when they get it. It's just like drinking salt water. The more you drink, the thirstier you are. The sin is not having more. The sin is being discontent. Mm. The sin is not in having wealth. The sin is in yes. what you do with it. It is not the amount. It's the attitude. He says even when you have surplus and you have excess, mm -hmm. that, does, that does not make for a real life. Mm -hmm. It is eternal life. That mm -hmm. is the only kind of life that is fulfilling, 
satisfying, meaningful, and purposeful. Producing peace and joy and hope and blessing? You're only going to get that from eternal life. The material world can never give that to you, even if you have more than enough. So Jesus is saying to the man and everybody who thought that way, you're going down the wrong path. You are drinking salt water. You're never going to have your thirst quenched because the life that you need that is satisfying and fulfilling, the life that is eternal and lasts forever is the life of God in your soul. It's not going to come through acquiring possessions. Greed is idolatry. It's worshiping the creature, not the creator. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants to give you the life and the truly and that truly is abundant and eternal. The admonition here is a loving attempt to correct another's attitude or behavior. Which we as believers need to be open to when someone in the body of Christ comes to correct us. Yes. They actually are loving us as our Father corrects and disciplines us. We are to take it in love and turn it around. Right. Yes, it's hard for us because our flesh is like, Rrr. but we need to be obedient and humble ourselves to righteousness, to truth. In our study of the Good Samaritan, yes. we learned that a parable is a story placed alongside a principle to illustrate a principle. So here in the parable of the rich fool, he said, the land of a certain rich man was very productive, and that's good. It is. So this man had a massive crop, and if you're a farmer, of all things that human beings do, farming is most dependent upon circumstances and factors that are outside your control. If you ever should be thanking God, it's as being a farmer because He controls all the elements that make your crops grow. In verse 17, this man began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? He faces a dilemma, about, a dilemma about what to do with this massive harvest. He would build more storage, but if you build more storage, he'd use more land, and that wouldn't take up, and that would take up the land that he grows the crop on. Maybe that's not the good way to go, because this is good productive land. What am I going to do? Where am I going to put this? This is where we begin to see what is truly in the man's heart. At this point, there are more options that could be pondered, but we read in verse 18 what his solution is. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. <laughs> this man has experienced an abundant harvest, mm. only uses the words I and my multiple wow. times. This gives us insight into the materialist mentality he possesses. It would make sense that he would be thanking God for the rainfall, since God is the one that makes the earth warm. He's the one that makes the seed to grow. Mm. The man should be saying, I am grateful and I wish to joyfully give it back to you, what you have so graciously given me. When is the last time you found yourself praying the Word of God? Reflecting back on the first commandment, the second commandment. I know I am to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord. And I cannot be restrained in my giving to you because my love commenced me to be generous with you. My love, your love for me, it gives. Yes. In the second law, you call us to love our neighbor as ourself. And because your love provides for me, I love these people and I want to share this with all others. Then, when this is lacking, we find ourselves depending on others and looking at our own strengths and abilities. Verse 19 reads, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many, many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. 
we should never find ourselves being independent from God, but rather looking to Him, our source for all provisions in everything. The materialist mindset is that you only go around once, so grab all you can get. The problem with this man is the, in the story is that he forgot God. He forgot the others. And he forgot his own mortality. Then comes the surprise, which is so common in Jesus' stories. Verse 20 it is. Yes. But God said to him, Fool, <laughs> this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared. Whose will they be? So, with no regard to his own mortality, this man has only thought of himself and his possessions on earth and nothing of eternity or his eternal well-being. James 4, 13 through 16 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such in such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, like steam on coffee. <laughs> you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this, and, or that you ought to say, if the Lord wills, and then if you are going to say the Ooh. Lord wills, you better be careful to know that you are right with the Lord. Jesus says, God said tonight, this very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? This is a materialist worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. This reminds us of Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. Verse 21. So is, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If you haven't used what God gives you for his glory, and for the benefit of others, and if you haven't dealt with your own mortality and prepared for eternity, you are living foolishly. Your obedience opens the doors for God's blessings. It's not about how much you have, it's about what you do with it. Two of the greatest temptations we face as believers are hypocrisy and greed. What is the most effective weapon that Christians can arm themselves with against the temptation of those sins? Let's pray. Lord, help us to occupy our mind with divine truth for strength to stand against temptation and sin. Show us how to study your word, God, and to receive the Holy Spirit's teaching and understanding. Daily, daily we are to grow closer to God in order for us to be more like him we thank you for being with us may you have a blessed day and until next time get connected to, to go, go vertical bye-bye